Welcome to LeapCast. I'm your host, Dr. George James. LEAP stands for leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And I'm on a journey to connect with high achievers and highlight their unexamined human moments. Tune in to learn how these high achieving LEAP individuals were able to reach their greatest potential, face their most difficult challenges, and embrace the human moments that helped them along the way. If you want to get the episode highlights directly in your email, then head to theleapcast.com right now to subscribe. Welcome to LeapCast. This is your host, Dr. George James, where we speak to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. I'm excited today to bring on another guest to the show, uh, Lisa Salters, who you all have probably seen reporting great, amazing stories in sports. And I hope to just learn a lot more about her. So, Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So uh, part of the way that we like to start off is something called Leap Story, where we just want to learn a little bit more about like your history. How did you even start off? You know, we'll eventually get to where you are now, but tell us a little bit about the early parts of your journey and the early parts of your life. Uh, well, I went to Penn State and I uh, majored in broadcast journalism. And uh, because I knew I, I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to do news. I wanted to be a reporter as a career. And so after I graduated from Penn State, where I majored in journalism with a broadcast option, I got a job at a local television station in Baltimore and uh, WBAL TV. And I worked there kind of as a, you know, a cub reporter for and, you know, ended up being there for seven years. And I did everything like when I first started, I, I really I wasn't a reporter at all. I was really kind of a gopher. You know, I ripped scripts, ran ran tape up to the control room. If anyone has ever seen that movie broadcast news from back in the day, that was kind of like the stuff that I did. And uh, I did that for seven years. And then I uh, hired an agent and within a couple of months had been hired by ABC Network News in New York. And they placed me out in Los Angeles to work for uh, ABC Network News. They needed someone to cover the OJ Simpson trials. So that's how I got to the network. And I lived in L.A., and did that for five years. And it after so after 12 years total of doing news, that's when I transitioned to sports. ESPN came calling, asking if I'd like to give sports a try, sports news a try. And uh, So you weren't doing I, sports news before that or like sports no, related? Oh. No, 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 not at all. No, I did hard news. Like I, you know, like I said, in Baltimore, I was, you know, doing crime, politics, stories like that. And at ABC, I did the O.J. Simpson trials. I did the TWA Flight 800 crash, the Oklahoma City bombing. Wow. Yeah, those are major uh, stories. The Shepard trial. Yeah, I did that. You know, I did news. So that was part of the reason why I wanted to give sports news a try. Is that the stories that I was doing for network news, they were so heavy yeah. and depressing. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I'd come home from work and just be kind of just bottomed out by it. So... You know, making the transition to sports seemed like a good fit. And, you know, I'm glad that I did it. You know, I was just in a conversation recently with I'm in the Philadelphia area and the Philadelphia Association of, of Black Journalists had a workshop seminar where they were just talking about what it means to kind of report some of these stories, some of these heavy stories. But then you have to be a certain way, not even show mm -hmm. emotion. And so when you talk about doing like, you know, those big stories, hard news. And being bottom out, I can just imagine that that was like probably really hard and tough to do that over and over. Yeah, absolutely. Like I remember spending nine days in Oklahoma City in the, you know, after the bombing of the Murrah Federal Building. And, you know, and I was there. That bombing happened in the morning, like six, seven o'clock in the morning. I was there by two o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, the debris is still smoldering and I'm standing like right in front of it. The rescue crews are still working, trying, you know, to get people out. Mm -hmm. uh, loved ones are rushing to the scene, you know, asking anybody, including, you know, us reporters standing up there, you know, where can I get information? My brother was in there. My sister was in there. My mother was in there, that kind of thing. And so I spent nine days there. And I remember on my flight home back to Los Angeles at the time, I remember just sitting in my seat on the plane and just crying yeah. because I was just so you know, I was, I, and, and, you know, I felt like, you know, I get to go home and these people, I'm leaving these people in Oklahoma city, you know, 
in their sorrow and their grief and I get to go home. And, you know, after a while, that just get, it just takes its toll on you. So I don't feel that as much during sports. <laughs> sessions. Right. I could imagine, you know, like mental health, maybe we're talking a little bit now more than before. But when you talk about those stories, like, you know, people weren't necessarily talking about mental health and no. vicarious trauma and any of these things. No, absolutely not back then. No, you just kind of did your job. That's why, you know, now when I see these reporters over in, uh, you know, in Ukraine and these war correspondents, I think of, you know, when I was back, when I was in my 20s and early 30s, that was, that was it. You know, you wanted to be a war correspondent. Yeah. You know, you wanted to be overseas and in the trenches. And now you could not pay me to do any of that stuff. <laughs> right. You know, I look at these people and I think like they think that they're like living their best life right now because they're over there and, you know, they're getting their stripes and, you know, they're, they're covering this war and they're important with their, they're doing important work. But, you know, talk to them 20 years from now, you yeah, know, exactly. and yeah. it's like, there's just no way like you couldn't pay me to do to do that now. But, wow. you know, you live and you grow. Yeah, you know, and like you said, like I, I can imagine, right? Like that's one of those things where when people talk about, like you know, you're cutting your teeth or like you know, right. like you said, earning your stripes, right? Like you want that assignment, but like, yeah, that assignment it does come with some other things with it. But you know, so as you shared, studying uh, journalism and broadcasting, but I guess I want to go even before that. How did you even know that you wanted to get into the field? Like, what? inspired you or made you even think about that like growing up lisa thomas laurie that's it i would see her on television every day and i you know would think to myself i could do that so that's it lisa thomas laurie inspired me to be to be a journalist wow it's and a short answer <laughs> it's a short answer <laughs> no you just is there something about just seeing her that made you say that i could do that and do you yeah. know how old you were when you made that decision you know, like 14, 15, you know, I remember, you know, being 16 and working at the mall in King of Prussia and like she walked in, <laughs> she walked into the, my store that where I worked and I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, I couldn't speak or do anything like that. But I was like, there she is. I'm going to be like her one day. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Did you ever meet her again? Yes. <laughs> yes. I was able to meet her and. Uh, become friends. I haven't spoken to her in a while, but uh, she knows that she, she knows that she was my hero growing up. I think that's so phenomenal when you know to have people that inspire you, that are your heroes, and 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 to go after the dream and the vision, and then to achieve it. And if you're lucky, to be able to tell that person like you allowed me to get to this, or inspired me to get to this place. I think that's really great. So. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say that I achieved what she has achieved, but <laughs> but definitely I she was the reason why I wanted to do what I do now. Well, I think that's awesome. And and then in growing up, did you was your family like on board with that? Would did they support you like wanting to achieve something like that? You know, once I told them what I wanted to do, you know, they they knew who Lisa Thomas Flory was as well. So they knew once I said, you know, I want to, I want to be like Lisa Thomas Laurie. They were fully on board, you know, with me choosing a major. And when I was at Penn State, and uh, yeah, they've always been very supportive. You know what's interesting, and in, in just you know, learning a little bit more about your, you know, your work now. Like you know, I've seen you for years, you know, on the sidelines, reported next to like so many different people, which we'll get into. But it, at some parts where when I've read, it makes it seem like you might have always wanted to get into sports and uh, highlight your early sports career. And because you were, you were, were, are an athlete, correct? I mean, I played basketball at Penn State. I was on the team, but I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't a star, didn't play much. I was pretty much a bench warmer, but I was athletic, I guess you could say, growing up. But uh, sports to me was always something that you did for fun. I never really considered doing it as a profession wow. and it's you know the sports sports news wasn't what it is today so like they didn't offer courses in it when i went to school mm -hmm. and so now you know students who you know who know that that's what they want to do they have it so much better because there are you know there's curriculum you know designed just for sports reporting which is great 
but uh, it wasn't that it wasn't that I wasn't exposed to it as you know as an education. It was more that I did just didn't think about doing sports mm-hmm. unless I was unless you were going to be an athlete. I just right. never considered a career in sports unless you were you know a player or a coach. And so for me, I knew I wanted to be a journalist, and I just always thought that that meant doing news. The same I didn't consider, like I didn't consider being a weather person either. You know, the, it was about the news what I saw on television. It was, even though there was a sports report and there was a weather report, I just, I just really kind of only focused on, you know, being a news reporter. And that makes complete sense. And it's interesting, even as you mentioned, just the weather, uh, weather person. Even that has changed so much. Like you know, I see so many of these weather individuals weather people who have phenomenal careers and are like yeah. the main star i mean al roker being one of those people right right, who right. like just they're you wouldn't I, sometimes i forget that they, that's you know where we learned about him as in weather or other people and just how people grow and build their careers in right. these areas but it would have never occurred to me to be you know like oh i want to be a, a weather person like i would never have thought about uh about like I, I don't know if, if he liked weather and then ended up being a weather a weather caster right. or if he was a person on television and then ended up doing weather. True. I'm not sure how that worked, but you know, I would have never even thought of that as a career choice. But it's a great career choice, of course, but I wouldn't have even thought of that as an option back then. So in the early two thousands you you said you hired an agent, uh, well, th- that you were out in L.A. for a little bit, and then this ESPN opportunity comes. Now, is that something, when you said you were going to try out sports news or sports mm-hmm. reporting, what made you say, okay, like, let me do it? I get the point where you mentioned that, like, you know, you already did this hard news and it was tough and maybe wanted to change. Was there anything else that made you say you wanted to try, you know, sports? I think it was just the opportunity to create a niche for myself. You know, I remember when I when I made the decision, I had the option to stay at ABC and continue doing what I was doing. I'd also been offered a position at CNN uh, to also do news, and then there was the ESPN gig. And you know, Some I good I, options I, right there. Yeah, so you know, I don't like change, so I was leaning towards resigning with ABC. Okay. And you know, I was going to get a raise, but you know, the thing is, with ABC, there were 150 correspondents at the time. And I, a friend of mine said, well, how many, you know, how many people work for ABC? How many reporters are there? And I said, I don't you know, 120 to 150. He said, how many are African-American? You know, maybe 50, 60. How many are women? And I was like, oh, you know, maybe 25, 30. It's like CNN, how many correspondents do they have around the world? You know, maybe 200. How many are women? I don't know, give them a number. How many are African-American women? I don't know, 30, 40, 50, I don't know. ESPN, how many correspondents do they have out in the field? I said 18. Wow. How many are African-American? Three. How many are women? How many are black women? Zero. And he said, that's where you're going to go because that's where you're going to shine. That's where you're going to stand out and be able to make a name for yourself. And that's what I did. (laughs) And and it kind of played out exactly the way that he said that it would. That's really great advice. Was this person that just somebody you just talked to, or was this? No, this was my best friend in, okay. in LA at the time. Yes. I mean, that's that's really great information and, and sound advice. And then he also saw... runs a, also the CEO of a company too, so he, he's pretty good at giving advice. So. <laughs> it sounds like it. Which you know, so many times though, I've seen people in their career not reach out to get advice at critical places turning points or the advice that they get is just not so great (laughs) and it was good that one you were willing to talk to it with your best friend at the time who had some you know good knowledge but also that you got good information and you were willing to take it oh yeah like all all big life decisions you know you're you're in your 20s too like then i guess i was in my 30s early 30s you know, all big decisions. I would think that everybody does that with big decisions that you go to your crew, whoever your crew is, and you're like, okay, let's talk this out. So again, because if it had been up to, if I had just done what I wanted to do, Mm -hmm. I would have just stayed at ABC because I don't like changes. So um, even though I wasn't, even though I wasn't necessarily happy there, I knew it was a great job. I was, you know, 28 years old. I was 33 years old and at the network. 
And, you know, for journalists, you know, you aspire to be at the network. And I went to the network when I was 28. Wow. So I figured I thought that I was at the top. And yeah. I thought that, that I should, this is what I'm supposed to, to want. I'm here. I'm doing it. Even though it's not very fulfilling, mm-hmm. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be, what I was taught I should be doing as a journalist, as a successful journalist. And you were in um, a good market too. You're in LA. I mean, like. And that's the thing. I wasn't, I wasn't doing, I wasn't in LA as a local reporter. I was in LA working for national news. Right. So, but that was also, you know, the thing is you're working for national news. You're one of. You know, you have 22 minutes of World News Tonight every day, Monday through Friday, 22 minutes for 150 correspondents around the country. So if you were on the air 15 times, I was told 15 times in a year, you're doing great. Okay. 15 times on World News Tonight, you're doing great. And the other stuff you'd be doing like Good Morning America, that kind of stuff. And can you imagine like 15 times? That's it. Yeah. So. So you took this chance. I mean, uh, yeah. I took a chance. I took I mean, a chance. And that makes sense, right? Like the start of like, you know, just trying, hoping for the airtime. And it still wouldn't be like in number wise, not that much. But and so you recognize that, got the advice, which once again, not everybody talks to their crew. I mean, I think that's the advice that I would even say or repeat from what you're saying is that, you know, if you're out there, take advice from your crew. Hopefully you got good people in your crew. Right. Exactly. You, you might need to evaluate your crew first. <laughs> but once you figure out who is in it. Get some good advice from them before you make life changing decisions. Right. Yeah. And actually it was, it was the one, it was the least lucrative financially because ABC was going to give me a raise. CNN was obviously going to have to pay me to get me to leave ABC and ESPN was, you know, they didn't have people like me. They didn't have news people. They were used to paying a lot less for their reporters. And so their whole point was they were trying to increase their credibility as not just a sports network. They wanted to get people with news backgrounds to bump up their credibility and to do news in sports. And so, they, you know, when I told them, you know, well, this is what I make at ABC, like you're going to have to do, <laughs> meet that. And they were like, whoa, we don't pay people that. Wow. And, and it was not a lie, but They're like, we don't pay our reporters that, but they're like, all right, we'll match that. But so like, I didn't get a raise. So it was the least, uh, you know, I I went to ESPN, not getting a raise and turning down big races from the other two. And, you know, I know, you know, this from, from just Carmen sports so much. Um, I've worked with athletes where they, you know, it's contract year, right? So, Mm -hmm. and they bet on themselves, right? Hoping that like, okay, you know what? I either believe in myself and my talent or this where I am and I'm going to make it work. And it sounds like that was your bet on myself time. It was, well, I was going, I was going with, I believed in the advice that I was given that this is, and it made sense to me. You get a chance to stand out yeah. doing this. Is that me? That is that noise in the background? Is that me? I might've been, but I don't, I don't hear it anymore. Okay. Yeah, I it made sense to me that this is this is a position where you're going to be able you're going to be the only black woman <laughs> that they have. And you know, I feel that that opened a lot of doors for me. And I it was my you know, once those doors were opened, it was up to me to make the most of those opportunities and to not mess up. And I think I just gave them reasons to keep giving me more and more. And you know, so the advice that I was giving, given it, it kind of panned out. You'll have a chance to stand out. I was the only, I was the only, I feel like I was the only black woman at ESPN as a reporter now, as a reporter, not at, on sports or anything like that, okay. but as a reporter for a long, long time. Like I'm trying to think who, maybe Josina Anderson. And that was like just within really? the last. I've been at ESPN 22 years and I feel like there wasn't anyone before Josina. And I think that Josina started there. Like maybe she's not there anymore, but I think maybe seven or eight years ago, it was a long time. Like, I think I had moved out of the reporter ranks and had moved on to just doing sidelines and there was no one, no one that I can think of. So you were holding it down as the (laughs) only black woman uh, reporter at ESPN for, it sounds like at least a decade. At least. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just incredible. Like once again, you know, blazing trails. And I, I can only imagine like when you talk about like 
you growing up and you, you know, having people that you looked up to and thinking about Lisa Thomas Lurie and and how she was, you know, pivotal for you. I can imagine just anyone like who wants to be in the business, especially at that time when now, you know, sports reporting, sports news is really starting to be on the come up to see you at the same like that's a career that I want. I mean, I could just imagine that it had to have inspired many people. Well, I hope so. I mean, now, you know, now there's there are many, many, many. But I, you know, I, I do recall it being a really long time before <laughs> the Maria Taylors of the world came along. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, Malika Andrews. And yeah. it's a lot different now. But, it, you know, I think I was it for a long time. So I'm curious with that. So you mentioned about somewhere, I guess, in the early 2000s. And I don't know when ESPN started to kind of take its rise, but I feel like it was around that time, you know, the, the Stuart Scott's, the, the Mm -hmm. centers, like, like, and how that became like a must see. And so you were there during the years when it was building the brand and the empire. What was that like for you? Well, I was also out, you know, I was a reporter and I lived in, you know, I didn't live in Connecticut where ESPN is based. So, you know, I wasn't, I was never, have never been around kind of like the mothership <laughs> that way. Right. So although I know New Stewart and I know all the anchors, you know, but I w- would only see them occasionally. So I never felt that I was part of that kind of that force that was, I mean, certainly I feel that I'm part of ESPN, but I never felt like that. I was, I never had that kind of swag where I, mm-hmm. I felt like I was part of this big, this big iconic thing. Because when you're out in the field, you're just kind of out in the field doing your thing, doing, you know, going to this game, going to that game. But for sure, like Stuart, Stuart was, he was just the guy. Mm. And, you know, his influence is still felt today with the, you know, sports center anchors and all sports anchors, like trying to come up with their catchphrases and all of that. But yeah, I mean, the 2000s, early 2000s, that was a, a great time to be at ESPN. And let's see, I went to ESPN in, in 2000. I've been there for 22 years. And I feel like now that we are, I felt like even back then, ESPN was the unquestioned worldwide leader in sports. But now there's just so much, so much other competition, Fox, and NBC, and not that those entities weren't around before, but there are a lot more, there's a lot more being put out there from other from other networks to rival ESPN. And that's good. I think that only serves the viewer. And, right. It and gives more, more opportunities it, for people. Yeah. And the fan. It's interesting, you, you know, when you mentioned Stuart Scott and like catchphrase, I, I think, was it Booyah? Was that his thing? Yeah, that was his. Booyah. <laughs> cool as the other side of the pillow. Oh, that's right. Right. Um, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. Lots of those. And so I guess, you know, as you are, have been, you know, doing the reporting, you know, on location in these different places. What's that experience been like for you in your career? So you're at a another game or a major game or, not, you know, I've often seen you football and basketball. I know you've covered other sports, but are those like mm-hmm. your main two? Those have become my, my main two. Yeah, I kind of try not to I don't have the bandwidth to pay much attention to any of the other ones. People are <laughs> like, oh, you're going to this baseball game. It's like, I can't, I can barely keep up with, you know, football in the NBA. Like I cannot watch hockey and baseball too. But uh, yeah, so, you know, the NFL and the NBA, those are my, those are the two that I feel like I'm responsible for. And the rest, I kind of do like try to follow like college basketball, WNBA, things like that. I try to, watch when other people are watching like for the final four or for mm-hmm. finals things like that the stanley cup playoffs that that kind of thing the world series but that's kind of it for me like i'll dip in when it's they're really big games but if i didn't like that all, my entire life would be consumed with sports and i have a nine-year-old so i can't just be doing sports all the <laughs> <Right>. time <laughs> so, you got other other things to do in right your life. other things to do like cook and clean and do laundry, that kind of thing. Yeah, oh, you know, like the Masters. I know everyone is so excited about the Masters that's coming on this weekend, uh-huh. uh, starting today, and I, I'm sure that I will not watch a single second of that. As intrigued as I am to see Tiger Woods play, right. um, yeah. I just don't have to. I just got home today from a, a game last night. I have too many other things to do. 
than to actually watch another sport. Another reason why I appreciate you joining us here on Leapcast, just talking about you know your experience and your career. And that makes me really curious about what does it entail for you going to a game? I believe you don't just show up. There's probably more you yeah. have to go they have to do. Yeah. So what is yeah. happens in your role to before you show up to a game? So for a football game, the week, you know, just the game is on Monday, Monday night. Mm-hmm. Tuesday morning you fly home. The rest of Tuesday, I try to just take off and not think about anything work-related. Wednesday, we get all of our research for the next game, the two teams, about 50 pages of research, and you just start prepping and studying. It's like I liken doing a a Monday night game to studying for an exam every week. So you start studying Wednesday. Thursday, you have your conference calls with the other people in your team. Friday, you start doing conference calls with players. Saturday is practice with, with the home team. So you fly to whatever, you either fly on Friday night or, or Saturday morning to, you know, the games in Seattle. You fly to Seattle, you go to Seahawks practice on, on Saturday, interview player, do production meetings with Pete Carroll and whatever players you've asked to talk to. Four or five players will come into the room one at a time, chit chat with them. Sunday, the arriving, the visiting team arrives in town and you do the same thing with them go to their hotel meet as when they arrive go to their hotel you have a conference room set up and you know you talk to the head coach offensive coordinator defensive coordinator four or five players obviously the quarterback and you know a defensive star maybe the running back a wide receiver and then monday's the game and then tuesday it starts all over again <laughs> you fly home try not to think about work tuesday and then wednesday you start all over again so it's every day during football season it's like a runaway freight train like you're either on board or you're going to get run over yeah so you know football you is had, your life at that point yes it's like you could have had a, an awful game on monday you could have had a great game on monday it doesn't matter once wednesday comes you really have no t- you can't be thinking about what Next one. what the game was like on monday you really just have to move on it's kind of like if you actually played in the game like if i had a good game the quarterback had a good game or a bad game. You cannot dwell on the last game. You have to move forward or you will get run over. Like they said, right, you can't have a memory, right? You have to, have, like you said, you have to really forget the last play or last game and move forward and just trust your talent and your team, I guess, at that point. And your preparation. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember I remember when I first, when I first started doing Monday Night Football, before I'd ever done a game, it was the preseason of 2012. And I remember... ESPN allowed me to kind of go out and visit a couple of training camps Mm -hmm. just to kind of get in front of teams and PR staffs and coaches just to kind of introduce myself because I had not done the NFL before. And um, I remember going to Denver Broncos training camp out in in, uh, Colorado. And it was when Peyton Manning had, you know, had gone to Denver. Mm -hmm. And so it was in the cafeteria and, you know, I had my little tray. They allowed me to eat lunch and I'm, and I'm talking to Peyton. Peyton's like, oh, congratulations on your, you know, your Monday night gig, you know, luck and everything. And how are you feeling about it? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm like, I'm really <laughs> nervous. And he's like, well, he's like, I know the feeling. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what would you be nervous about? And he goes, why are you nervous? And I said, well, you know, I've been done this. Be- like, yeah, I haven't done this before. This is new. And he said, I haven't done this before here either. And I'm coming off of neck surgery. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to work. And he said, I can't rely on just because I have been successful in Indianapolis. That doesn't mean I'm going to be successful here. And he said, but do you feel like you've prepared? And I said, yes. He goes, you have to trust your preparation. He goes, that's what I'm doing. I'm trusting my preparation. And I was like, okay, all right, thanks. But it worked out for him. And so far it's worked out out for you. I think that's just another gem. Trust the preparation. You know, like you said, right, you know, the team talent. Or preparation, and it sounds like you do so much prep to be ready for whatever can happen. Because I and you know, in any of these sports, somebody could get injured between the time you start the prep versus the game, or somebody is somehow is not playing, or something changes. Like and and being ready for all of that. I mean, that, that's a lot that you have to be ready for for each game. Yeah, I mean, we there's so much that we never get to say. As a sideline reporter, especially, we just leave so much on the floor. We're so over prepared. But, you know, you know, 
luck favors the, uh, the prepared, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not the same chance favors the prepared. Yeah, so yeah. when you're like, oh, you were really lucky that you were able to, well, were you lucky or were you, <laughs> you prepared? <laughs> you know, you, you, you know, you actually studied and were ready in case that happened. And it turns out that it did happen. And so you were prepared. So that's why I always try to always try to be prepared. And I would imagine you don't do 22 years at ESPN or any of these jobs at this level without preparation and being good at it or, or put in the time. You know, you just said, like, you know, from Wednesday to, you know, the game, you're, you know, making sure you're aware of all these things prep mm -hmm. and so yeah. forth. And I would imagine that's also helped with your longevity. I'd like to think so. You know, now that I'm probably closer to the end of my career, not probably I am closer to the end of my career than I am the beginning, you know, that's one thing that I can look back on and be proud of just longevity because it, you know this industry is such a you can really be it's easy to be a flash in the pan yeah I, there are people who are you know just hot one second and everyone loves them and then the next year they're not they're out of television yeah and so to be able to you know look back and and know that you know i started in 1988 you know 34 years later you know i'm still doing it that in itself means a lot. No, that's awesome. And that means a lot. You know, even the work that I do as a therapist, you know, I've been doing this now 19 plus years and working with individuals, couples, families, businesses, media folks, and, you know, recognizing that I've had to learn so much and then I had to show up. But hearing, you know, how the emphasis you're making on preparation it talks up to me about like all the things I had to do to just show up for one client each day, right? That right. I had to go through that early work and prep to get to the place where I can meet with people. And I'm happy to hear your story. And I'm curious though, that I know you, like you said, basketball and football, and I don't know if it's like maybe November or maybe Christmas game, you could show up at a basketball game and a football game. Yeah, <laughs> with all the prep you just said, like that has to be madness. It is, and it is madness, and that's not my favorite thing to do either. But every once in a while, the Monday Night Football will fall on a Christmas Day, and Christmas Day is always when we do. You know, that's when the NBA has its big showcase, the big yeah. games, and so, or even if it's not on that day, you know, even if Christmas is on a Saturday and Monday Night Football is on a Monday, still. That's a lot, you yeah. know, to be before the game on Christmas and basketball and in a completely different sport two days later is a lot. So as much as Christmas is still my favorite time of the year, <laughs> it is also the most hectic because of the way the NBA schedules and the, and the uh, NFL schedules collide. And it is. It's a collision for sure. But what I always say, it's Christmas. So who's not happy? At, <laughs> right. Who's not happy at Christmas? There's still a reason to be happy. Right. I'm curious when you mentioned about, you know, basketball and football and, you know, the WNBA has done a great job and uh, the women basketball players are phenomenal. Their talent and ability in their sport is has grown and still has a long way to go. Or even just watching the national championship the other day with with South Carolina and just mm -hmm. excited for what they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that these areas have not always been kind, thoughtful, friendly to women. And when you say that you were for at least a decade, the only black woman mm -hmm. reporting and going into these places, you know, football and basketball. I'm curious on two levels. What would you say has been some of your greatest moments? And what would you say have been some of the most challenging moments in those arenas? I guess the most challenging was always kind of the, just establishing yourself. But for me, I always felt that I didn't have to I never tried that hard because I always felt like, look, I come from news, so I already feel like I'm more, I'm more, right. <laughs> I'm, I already feel like I'm overqualified for this. So right. you guys I can, can leave like, today. Yeah, you can look at me sideways if you want, but I'm a news reporter. So don't right. even think that, you know, your little sports thing is, is all that. <laughs> so Come talk maybe to me when you've, when you've done an, a national crisis. Then, then we yeah, can talk. so, you know, that's probably not the right attitude to have. But I always kind of looked at it like, look, I, I'm a news correspondent. So whatever you have, whatever's going on with this sports thing, you know, I got this. Yeah. So, you know, 
But we um, all need that confidence, though. I mean, that's how I hear it. We all need the confidence. Even sometimes you see with, you know, athletes, sometimes you need that chip on your shoulder to say, like, right. I belong here and I know that I'm good or I can I know I can do my job at a high right. level, especially with what you've been saying so far. Right. So, you know, if that may have been people always ask, like, oh, did you know, did did were you discriminated against? Did they treat you differently because you're a woman? If they did, I never noticed it because I always walked into a production meeting or to a room thinking, you know. I'm the most qualified person here <laughs> in my role, right. in my role. So, no, I never felt that way. You know, there were a few times that I I noticed that, you know, it would be all men in the room, you know, the coach and the announcers, the producer and the director and me in a production meeting. And the coach or whoever's talking wouldn't look at me. They would look at everyone else. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, this is this good old boy thing. Yeah. Like, you know. You're not going to even make eye contact with me. Fine. And then it wasn't until years later in the NFL that I realized it wasn't necessarily that they weren't looking at me because I was a woman is that they weren't looking at me because they didn't know me. And so people tend to gravitate when you're in a room talking, you gravitate to the eyes that, you know, mm -hmm. so when we were get, having different booths in Monday night football, you know, we had Mike Tariqa and John Gruden and yeah. then they left and then we'd have new guys, Sean McDonough. And, you know, other people were, were coming in. I realized when the new guys came in, those coaches would look at me in the production meeting because oh. I was the person that they knew. You were the and they didn't know. They didn't know the new guys. Yeah. And I, it, that's when it dawned on me that they weren't necessarily being, you know, misogynistic. They were just doing what you do because of human nature. You, you look at who you know. And so I kind of chuckled to myself when I see, you know, these coaches they kind of look at me because they're used to seeing me for 10 years right. instead of the guys, some of the guys that, you know, the new announcers that they had maybe just met. So yeah, if, if I have been discriminated against because of, because I'm, I'm a woman, I haven't noticed it, but um, I'm, I'm sure maybe that I have, mm -hmm. but uh, I haven't felt it or I haven't really allowed myself to feel it. Right. And I think maybe that, that's more important. I haven't really allowed myself yeah. to feel it. And that's allowed you to, keep going right to know that you're going to show up and do your and your do job. my do my yeah whether they and whether you like it or not right so. i'm gonna be here <laughs> right so you know a few questions i like to ask at the you know as we wrap up one i'm curious about is there anything that you are working on now or that you are involved with whether at work or outside of work or a project or anything like that no um right now i'm just getting ready for the nba playoffs to start Playing games are next week, so I'll be doing playing game games next week, and the playoffs start next weekend, Easter weekend, and then after that, like once you know, once the NBA finals are over, then I kind of get a break for July and a little bit of August, and then once NFL preseason starts, it starts all over again. You know, goes from late August to June, starts all over again. So as you can imagine, the summertime is is my time. Right. Don't call and, me for nothing. You're right. Don't even look at me. <laughs> Don't even, you know, take my number out of your phone. Right. But which isn't true because I still do things for outside the lines in E60 over the summer, but very much here and there. So, Sounds like, right. That becomes your me time that you get to do yeah, things you want. Exactly. Do. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, the other question I ask is um, you, you know, at least in the sports world and maybe beyond, you've been able to work with interview some of the biggest, greatest athletes, especially in football and basketball, multiple times where they know your name. I mean, even sometimes mm -hmm. I see you with them and it, it seems like, you know, there's a, almost like a friendship or just a mm -hmm. respect that you have because they've known you mm -hmm. and you know them. Uh, right. So I'm curious, one, what's one of the, the greatest moments you've had with an athlete that you remember or that has been uh, uh, impactful for you? Hmm, one of the greatest moments. You know, I just appreciate it when, you know, it was about 10 years ago when I did a story about Dwayne Wade and his mom. And I remember, you know, Dwayne texting and saying, you know, how to go with my mom today. And I was like, great. It was really great. It, you know, it was a hard story. It was her talking about, you know, drug addiction and how it impacted her life. And she went to prison and, you know, was out of Dwayne's life for, you know, many years because of addiction. And so it was, you know, a tough, 
tough story to tell. And um, I remember asking Dwayne, like, you know, how come you wanted me to be the, you know, the reporter on this story? And he said, because I trust you. And I knew that you would be honest and fair and that you would tell the story the right way without adding anything to it or taking anything away from it. But when he said, I trusted you, yeah. that, you know, that meant a lot. Today, you know, I feel like I'm the, kind of the old lady now in, um, in sports, especially thanks to Lamar Jackson, who has named me Miss Lisa now that other people, other people now call me Miss Lisa oh, really? too. <laughs> yes. So that, that is stuck. So, it's but respect. yeah, and I, <laughs> and I asked the first time he did it, like, you know, Twitter went crazy. And I said, I said to him the, the next time I saw him, yeah, I was like, you know, everyone kind of thinks it's funny that you call me Miss Lisa. He goes, that's respect. He's like, yeah. that's just, I'm just giving you your respect that you deserve. Right. And I was like, I appreciate that. Like, I, I understand why you do it. But yeah, people, someone just yesterday called me Miss Lisa. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, I like it. That's I like great. It. I love it. Yeah. I, I have been around, around a while, a while, and I'm proud of that. Around here, they would say, I guess you've moved into old head status. Yes, so. I am definitely old head status. <laughs> yes. With all the people that you have worked with, is there who would you love to work with or collaborate with, whether to do a story on or do a story with? Like, who would it be? Oh, I don't know. I can't. Uh, I can't think of anyone. I mean, I meet. I'm around teams all the time and I hear stories about guys in there and how they grew up all the time. And, you know, almost every day I'm thinking, boy, that'd be great to do a story on him. Oh, we should, we should do a story on him. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. If you have any ideas, you know, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Uh, uh, but I guess I was even curious, even outside of sports, if there's any ever been someone you like really wanted to work with or interview or connect with. You know, it was cool. We did a, a kind of a throwback game yesterday for uh, the NBA to celebrate the league 75 oh, yeah, year yeah. anniversary. And I got a chance to talk to Leslie Visser, who, I mean, just the things that she's done for not just women in sports, but just for all of sports, the events that she's covered, just the pioneer that she was. It was so cool to kind of just talk to her and her experiences and you know, the one thing that I found so fascinating and I said to her, I was like, how did you do your job when you didn't have any role models? There was nobody you could look to, not a one, no one you could call to say, hey, how do you approach this or how do you do? Not, not a one person. And you were it. And she said, you know, she just said, I just did it. Like, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to just be the only one and have no, you know, no history or no one to kind of look to when you're not sure about something wow. you know I have, I have lots of people you know when i first started doing sidelines my first call was to Susie Culver, oh, yeah. uh pam oliver you know i can call, i call pam now like hey like how do you approach halftime like when you're trying to do this like what do you do and you know and it, to not have you know Anyone, mentors yeah. or people like that that are just peers who you can go to and ask a question i couldn't imagine what that would be like and yet leslie Bisser did it with um you know not just professionalism but with you know grace dignity she's also being honored this year at the sports emmys uh, with a lifetime achievement award oh, it's like wow that is long overdue yeah, well, yeah the first woman to get the lifetime achievement award long overdue wow no, that sounds amazing. And, you know, what people have had to go through in different areas, different identities, to be a trailblazer, to have no one in front of you, and to deal with the nonsense that comes with that, too. Mm -hmm. That That's comes with it. So yeah. incredible. So the last two questions. What does mental wellness mean for you? Uh, mental wellness, always feeling good about yourself. You know, that's something that I never kind of struggled with. Things haven't always been easy, right. certainly. Always, I guess that was just instilled in me by my parents, but I've always just always felt good about myself and always realized that that doesn't really matter what other people think about me, that what matters is what I think about me. Yeah. And so as long as I know that I'm doing the best I can or that I know that I what I need to work on, that I'm good. So even when things are not going so great at work, or at home or anywhere, you know, for me, just feeling good about myself and my 
ability to fix whatever is going wrong. I guess that's where people struggle is that they have issues they pro- and problems and they don't know how to fix things. But, you know, I've always felt like I have the capacity, even if it's not within myself to fix things, I know where to get help. I know where to, where to you know, where to look to, like, you know, with my friend mm-hmm. you know, 22 years ago. I don't know what to do. I'm kind of at a crossroads, but crossroads, but I knew where to go to, you know, to help me figure things out. And so that's what mental health means to me. Just knowing, you know, one, feeling good about yourself. And, and when you don't feel good, knowing where to go to help you figure things out. I think that's so important. And, you know, in my work, like, you know, I mentioned is trying to be that one of those places that people can come to. And I've valued, especially as I've had more athletes and entertainers be willing to just share their story because they feel so alone or isolated or they can't tell their friend or family or manager or teammate and sometimes mm-hmm. just feel stuck. And so it's great that you have felt you know, good about yourself and that you also know where to go. Last question, what mental wellness advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, and that could be as early as yesterday or any time in the past repeat that again the mental health what mental wellness advice like what what would you say to your younger self at any point yesterday or before around mental wellness don't overlook it make sure you know i'm from the old school where you weren't really supposed to talk about you know your feelings (laughs) you know so don't you know don't believe that hype don't believe that lie that, you know, you can always talk about your feelings and don't, don't take it lightly, take it seriously. And fortunately, again, like I said, I, I, I have felt completely supported my entire life. So I, I can't think of a time where I felt like I was alone or on an island or anything like that. But, you know, I would tell my younger self to, even if it's not for me, don't overlook it for other people, your friends. Don't be afraid to ask like your friends, are, are you okay? Um, yeah. Or I don't think that you're okay. Like, let's talk about it. Don't, don't be afraid to put it out there. I, I think that's really great to, especially in lots of different communities and spaces. Sometimes we do overlook it or we overlook it for those around us. So I think that's really great. Lisa, or as Lamar Jackson will call you, Miss Lisa, I appreciate <laughs> you joining me on Leapcast and just sharing your journey and your story and dropping gems, you know, the value of having good people in your crew that you can talk to and the importance of preparation and just being able to know that you belong in the room and overlooking, you know, any of the nonsense that people try to send your way. You've shared so much today and I really appreciate all that you've shared. And so before we end, is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? No, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks for the work that you do. Wow, what an incredible ride we just went on with another great member of the Leapcast community. I appreciate you listening and hope you got some tangible value from the episode. Please let us know what you think by leaving a comment, rating, and review. As always, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Dr. George James, and I'll see you next time.